Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hi, and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, you may recall about a month ago, we recorded a number of podcasts on sustainability and aligning uh, your ISO standards with the sustainable development goals. And we've also covered a number of uh, podcasts on going carbon neutral. And uh, we talked about ISO 14064 on carbon footprint verification and also PAS 2060 on carbon neutrality. Well, as we've been working with a number of organisations to help them to go carbon neutral, David Algar, who's the principal carbonologist at Carbonology, discovered tree economy. Now, tree economy are quite unique in the UK in that they are a credible carbon offsetting organisation that is recognised through PAS 2060. So um, there are very few organisations that PAS 2060 actually recognises as a credible carbon offsetting organisation. So I thought it was high time that we got tree economy onto the podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Harry Grocott, who's the CEO and co-founder of Tree Economy. Hi, Harry. Hi, Melanie. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. I know we had a conversation last year when I mentioned about doing this podcast. So yeah, absolutely delighted that you can join us today because I know that you've been extremely busy over the last few months. But yeah, you're probably much better at explaining what Tree Economy actually does. So would, would you mind just providing our listeners with an introduction to the company and what you do, please? Sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So as mentioned, my name's Harry. I'm the CEO and, and co-founder at Tree Economy. Tree Economy is a nature-based carbon removal and, and restoration business. So we work with landowners both in the UK and, and now increasingly internationally to create really world-class nature restoration projects with the intent of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and storing it in a healthy ecosystem. Uh, so we're very hands-on in terms of project design, uh, looking at things like afforestation, rewilding, peatland restoration. And then we've also been, a, a very big focus for us has been on evidencing the impact. So we've been building a software platform and remote sensing and AI capability to actually go around and calculate the exact a carbon impact that we have through these projects. So one side of our business is working with landowners to, to create, source and develop the projects. The other side of the business is then uh, actually monitoring, tracking and calculating the carbon impact. Uh, and it's that second piece which is really important because otherwise it's really kind of guesswork in terms of how much of an impact these projects are having and leads to a lot of the issues that, that are prevalent in the rest of the carbon market. But we're, we're based in the UK, um, so our team is London-based, but we, we have a lot of work up in Scotland. We're nine people at the moment and looking to expand. There's a lot of interest in what we're doing, and we're, we're doing our best to pedal in and keep up, which is great and very exciting for us. So we're, yeah, we're, we're based in London. We're part of something called the Centre for Climate Change Innovation, uh, which is a hub between the Grantham Institute for Climate Change out of Imperial College uh, and the Royal Institution. So we're very fortunate to have some workspace in, in the Royal Institution which is mainly a museum, which is a funny place to work, um, but, but quite nice to, to have, have some space there. But yeah, yeah, so um, that, that's what we do. Fantastic. Thanks for providing that introduction. And there, there are a number of questions that I'd love to ask around those areas that you mentioned that I'm sure we'll, we'll have time to dive into. So just going back, you mentioned about land owners and also offset buyers as well. So what are the different options then for landowners and also for offset buyers? Yeah, it, it can be a little bit confusing. In one sense, it's very simple, but it's also quite new. And then there's, there's a level of nuance within it. So uh, if we start on the supply side of our business, that's the landowners. Uh, essentially, it's, it's, a, it's changing land use from one to another. Um, so up in Scotland, quite a lot of the time, we see landowners, small family farms and estates, predominantly some institutional landowners as well, who have land perhaps in kind of sheep grazing, um, so less favorable agricultural land or potentially just uh, sort of grouse moor that really doesn't have a huge amount of productive use and could be put to use in a, a more sort of carbon intensive way in terms of removal, 
but also financially as well. The, these areas of land don't generate significant income for, for landowners. With the shift in subsidies, there's there's a loss of income for a lot of these landowners now as well as we, we leave the EU. So there's quite a lot of disruption in kind of the land owning market. So essentially what we do with them, um, we can help them scope their estate. So we, we use some of the remote sensing that, that we've built to have a look at the estate. Um, and then we work with field partners that we've been working with for quite a long time now to scope out potential areas for afforestation. So what tree species should we be planting? What is native? What is natural? And look to promote those sorts of tree planting activities. And then our main job is, is actually making sure that the carbon project or the, the afforestation project is a verified carbon project. So simply going out and, and planting trees um, is obviously a good thing to be doing, but it, it doesn't actually mean that it's, it's a verified carbon scheme. So my co-founder, Rob, leads on, on this side of our business, but working in a very hands-on manner with the landowners, with our implementation and tree partners to ensure that the scheme is suitable, is verified, and that then goes under something called the Woodland Carbon Code in, in the UK. So we basically offer a, a turnkey option for landowners to say, you know, what land have you got? How could you turn that into a carbon project and then actually implementing it? And then the other part of, of what we do for landowners is then helping sell those carbon credits, because otherwise you've got a kind of very isolated landowner and then a huge potential option and array of buyers, but very difficult to actually connect to those. A lot of these, these carbon offset purchases are, are corporates. They're often you know, very hard to get in touch with, very difficult to market to. So what we've been spending a lot of the last 24 months doing as a company is, is building up those relationships and connections with high quality carbon buyers and, and connecting the supply with the demand side. So for landowners, it's monitoring development and then the, the actual brokerage piece. We monetize as a business by taking some of the carbon credits that we sell. Um, so we take a, a small percentage off that, but then pass most of the revenue back through to the landowners. So it, it's a for-profit nature restoration investment, essentially, for, for those landowners. That's, that's really the pitch. And then in terms of, of corporate buyers, because we have a number of projects and a number of carbon credits, we can offer uh, a range of different credit prices, carbon credit types, different locations, depending on, on what they're looking for. And then obviously working with the likes of yourselves at, at Carbonology to help actually filter what those different requirements are based on, on different standards. Okay, so you mentioned about nature restoration. Can we actually quantify the value of nature? I know that's a big <laughs> question to ask. <laughs> I'm going to ask it. I'm going to put it out there. It sounds as though it would be incredibly difficult to do, but can, can we actually quantify the value of nature? I mean, the short answer right now is no, but there's a lot of nuance within that. So natural capital is the framework for, for thinking about this. So the idea being nature delivers lots of different value to us, different services known as ecosystem services. So if you imagine a farm, for example, a farm produces calories. So whether that's wheat or it's corn or whatever that's going to be, that's a service that it delivers. And we price that service. So we, we know that farms give us food and we pay for that food. So that's, you know, nature has value based on, on that principle. Uh, likewise, natural resources like, I don't know, coal and oil in, historically or other minerals, that is a stock of value within nature. And we can kind of get that, that service out of it. But now we're beginning to slowly beginning to price these other services. So carbon removal and storage, we have this big problem of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. So nature and systems, ecosystems that remove and store that carbon dioxide for us as, as humanity is valuable and becoming more valuable. And that's where the carbon market has built in. But then there's really high value, but as yet unquantified areas more broadly around biodiversity, for example, how do you put a price on biodiversity like that? That's such a tricky aspect to, to tackle because how do you price that in the UK, for example, if you go from a grouse moorland into a native forest, what is the value of that biodiversity increase versus biodiversity in, let's say, Colombia, for example, how do you, how do you compare those bits? It's incredible to think about, but, but very tricky. The good thing is that it is beginning to get priced. So the, the biodiversity aspects that they're looking to start building, if not a market, then at least some kind of, of system to, to back that. England has a biodiversity net gain trial that, that's still ongoing, which is a good start because we need to start. The, the issue when 
we only price some bits of nature is that we then optimize for those. So you've seen this, for example, through carbon offsetting, a lot of the forests that were created originally were monoculture, fast growing forests. So good in theory from a carbon removal perspective, but, but very bad from a, a biodiversity perspective. So we kind of need to be able to price the whole thing at once to have the right incentives to build the, the best possible ecosystem. So yeah, there, there's, I'm slightly waffling on, on those bits, but. Um... <laughs> You've done a, a grand job in trying to uh, answer that question. Thanks, Harry. <laughs> but I think the point that you've, you've really clearly made, the point there is that it's not just about CO2 emissions and offsetting, is it? There's so much more that we need to consider for our planet. You know, look, you mentioned earlier about rewilding and, you know, there are various projects going on around that that are having a tremendous positive impact on those environments where that does happen because we have lost a lot of wildlife and, and a lot of nature activities. I know that when I mean, I'm from Cumbria originally and, uh, and I was reading that many, many years ago, there were hundreds of orchards across Cumbria mm -hmm. and, and it just makes you think, well, what, what's actually, you know, because of that losing those orchards, you know, the wildlife that, that they would attract must have a, a damaging effect on that region, let alone, you know, the country as well, if you've got other counties that are similar. So, yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, it's a really good point that you've made that it's about looking at the bigger picture, isn't it? And nature restoration as opposed to just removing GHG emissions. Now, obviously, there's a lot of greenwashing going on. <laughs> I think that has been one of the downsides. I think we've seen, because we, we've been implementing ISO 14001, for example, for about 17 years and ISO 50,000 on the energy management standard for over 10 years. And now we're implementing the carbon standards. And it's great that the demand for standardization and having robust controls in place for identifying what your environmental footprint is and how you can implement controls are. But one of the downsides to that is that there's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon and there's a lot of greenwashing going on. And how can, how can people be sure that this doesn't fall under greenwashing? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's really sad to see that it can be exploited to such a, a large extent for greenwash, the carbon offset market I'm, I'm talking about here particularly. So I think there are two elements here of greenwash. One is at the project level. So the actual carbon credits themselves and, and the impact. Uh, and secondly, it's then at the corporate level, which is where the claims are then getting made. So working with, with the second of those first, obviously the ISO standards and, and that kind of rigorous process is beginning to solve or, or is solving that, that second issue around, are you certified carbon neutral or not? And there's a very clear set of requirements in order to get to that. And I think that's fantastic. And that's exactly what's needed because I think it's worth perhaps just very quickly stepping back. The voluntary carbon market is what we're talking about. It's now a market about $2 billion in, in size. It's kind of triple, tripled or triple doubled over the last couple of years. Um, so it's, it's rapid growth. It is a, an unregulated market for trading invisible gas. So it's, it's, it's in somewhat unsurprising that, that there is this issue around greenwash and, and false claims because it's very easy to do that. There's a forest that you're never going to see and I'm going to sell you some invisible carbon from that site. It's very easy to get well, to get cowboys operating in, in that market. So it's good if, if the demand side, the corporate element of that is now being buttressed with, with ISO standards, that begins to solve that. The issue then really remains on the actual project and carbon offset side. Now, there are a number of carbon standards. They're called standards, but they don't necessarily hold themselves to the same level as an ISO standard. So I think there's, there's a bit of, of untangling to be done there in terms of wording. In the UK, we have the Woodland Carbon Code, and there's also a Peatland Carbon Code, uh, and they, as it says on the tin, support afforestation and, and woodland projects or peatland protection projects. Internationally, there's four very large standards, the largest of which is called VERA, and they've got this voluntary carbon standard called VCS. So VERA VCS is, is the largest internationally. Now, in theory, those should be setting the requirements and very strict benchmarks for projects to be developed. The issue, as has, has come out very recently through a, a Guardian report that's been published, the standards and processes in place for project development are just not that high and not that, not that robust, which means it's very difficult for the corporate buyer who is going through their sort of ISO standard carbon neutral process 
to actually find the correct offset, which is only one part of that whole carbon neutral stack, but to find the offset that is appropriate and doesn't let them slip and kind of do the wrong thing. Because you have all of the, you have all, all of the wrong incentives. You're a company, you've got a requirement to generate profit and increasing profit to shareholders or, or to yourself if you're a smaller business. So when you see a, a carbon offset that is $5 or five pounds versus a carbon offset that is 30 pounds in a voluntary market where nobody is telling you to do it, there is a strong incentive to pick the cheap one because they all have the same tick box. But unfortunately, as is now beginning to be evidenced, a lot of those credits and a lot of those cheap credits are cheap because there's no process in place to evidence and track impact. Um, and it's very, very easy to slip. And that's being generous to companies. There's a lot of companies that just don't care and will just tick box, buy the cheap one, and that's the incentive. But the really difficult thing is where you see companies that are trying to do the right thing, but make the wrong decision in terms of purchasing, and they still slip up and, and they get put into the sort of greenwash bucket, kind of canceled company type outcome. So it's very, very tricky, but there are companies like ours, and, and I'm happy to say a number of others in our space that are now beginning to bring an additional level of uh, reporting information and disclosure on projects to actually evidence the impact. And I think that's obviously, I would say this because it's, it's our company and, and uh, you know, I, I'd be a poor CEO if I wasn't plugging us, but, but you can actually begin to, to really dig into evidence and, and good projects have good reporting that sits above and beyond the very low thresholds for standardization at the moment. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, we've seen that when David's had to break a few finance directors' hearts when they're saying, oh, well, what about these options for our setting, which, you know, could be cheap as chips, but actually they're not meeting the requirements of past 2060. And David's like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> they're just not acceptable. And I think there's, there's such a lot of education that's needed in this space and of raising of awareness. And hopefully this podcast is just one tiny way of being able to make people aware that there are credible options for doing this the right way. And then there are other cowboy routes. And a lot of our podcast listeners will relate to this because in the ISO standards world, you can either get certified with like a UCAS accredited certification body. So that's the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, so the government body that governs the certification bodies to go down the legitimate route and you get the value from that. Or you can just go online and, you know, pay some money, get a certificate, get a manual, but it's worthless. There's absolutely no value in it because it, it's the dished out, you know, ten a penny. So I think a lot of our listeners will relate to this issue <laughs> that we're currently facing at the moment in the carbon offsetting world as well. Uh, so if one of our listeners was looking to, you know, they've they've addressed what their carbon footprint is. They've gone through ISO 14064, so they've verified their carbon footprint against a credible methodology, such as ISO 14064. And they've done all that they can to reduce their carbon footprint, but now they want to buy some carbon credits. How can somebody go about buying and monitoring those carbon credits? Yeah, so it's, it's not easy for starters. There are marketplaces that are now popping up that, that are making it slightly easier, but essentially the way that it would work right now without a company such as ours is that you would need to go and find the company that's actually developing the project. So there's no kind of central marketplace. There is no hub for these transactions. So you'd have to go to the individual company that's developing the project, and then you'd need to, to place a transaction with them directly for a, a particular project that's generating the, the carbon credits that, that you need. So it's very tricky to actually go in and find those. So what we've done is we, we've developed a, a platform product to, to help solve this called Sherwood. Um, so through Sherwood, you can actually have a look at all of the projects that we're developing. You can see the individual landowners that, that actually sit behind these projects as well. You can see the, the inventory, so the carbon inventory that's attached to those, the, the pricing. So we price each project independently of each other because some projects require different pricing inputs. They have different benefits attached to it. And, and we, we make that super transparent. So you can see essentially a, a list, a little bit like an Airbnb style platform of seeing different projects, seeing the credits and, and the price points. You can, you can go through and you can actually transact directly on those projects. 
And really importantly, the piece that we can show is the vintage and timing breakdown of that carbon impact itself, which is super important for some of these ISO standards and certifications, because you need to make sure that the carbon credit you're purchasing is an ex post or a historic carbon credit. So what does that mean? If you imagine you're planting a forest, so it's an afforestation carbon removal project, those trees will take time to grow. And therefore, it will take time for that carbon dioxide to be removed from the atmosphere. And you need to buy a carbon credit that says at this date in 2023, it had removed 100 tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I need 100 carbon credits of actual impact. And that's what our monitoring is designed to break down. So we can actually support you with that very niche um, requirement, but, but very hard to evidence requirement, which is, has this actually happened or is that a future looking credit? Am I going to be you know, am I attempting to, to attain this certification into the future and I'm looking to pre-purchase potentially, then you need to know if that's actually crystallized and has happened or has not happened. And that's, that's really what we begin to break down. Without the monitoring platform, without Sherwood that we've built, it's quite hard to actually evidence and prove that. And a lot of the existing developers who, who are doing fantastic work in terms of project implementation and getting projects planted for trees may not actually then have that additional layer of reporting available, which means they're doing something good, but they can't quite do the next step of, of then actually evidencing that to, to an ISO standard uh, or an ISO standard requirement. So yeah, the, the monitoring piece is quite difficult. There are not so many companies that are, that are developing this. It's a little bit tricky from a technical perspective. We use a range of drones and satellites and, and AI programs to actually do this. It's taken a lot of funding for us to get where we are through some venture capital investment and public grants. So there's, um, yeah, there's quite a lot of kind of backlog that goes into it, but it is now possible. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible through working with, with you guys. I mean, that sounds like uh, such a worthwhile exercise to do that because obviously, you know, the, the concept and principles are there. And obviously you've got, right, that you've got projects, you know, here in the UK and obviously expanding overseas as well. But without the facility to be able to monitor and measure the effectiveness of what you're actually doing and, and have a full audit trail, you know, without that traceability, it's going to lack credibility in some respects, because obviously you do need that evidence, don't you? And I think, you know, in the future, if we're going to see an increase in legislation coming to, to try and combat greenwashing, this sort of evidence is going to be essential uh, to demonstrating that evidence. So. Yeah, so good luck with that. I know that uh, obviously it's, it's almost like unknown territory in some respects uh, in terms of where you're heading with this. But yeah, very commendable and uh, yeah, really excited to see where that's going. And in terms of how did you get involved in this in the first place, Harry? I should have probably started with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how, how did you get involved with all of this? What's your background? Yeah, it's a good question. How, how do you end up? How do you end up here in this mess? <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so, so I originally I was I was a physical geography student. So I studied climate change science. I was very very fortunate to do a, a field trip to Brazil. So we went to the Atlantic rainforest. So I had quite a hands on experience out there. My dad was a geography teacher. Um, so I just assumed I would become a geography teacher because I just think that's what all geography students end up doing. So so that, that that's where I. I started, I actually ended up working in wealth management. So I, I worked in the city, I worked in finance for three and a half years. I, I qualified there as a financial advisor. I did six exams necessary for, for that, which was, which was useful and interesting. And I could quite happily probably have, have stayed there and, and had you know, quite a comfortable career there as, a, as an advisor. But what I, what I realized working in, in finance was that money is not the issue. There's plenty of, of investment capital lying around. The real problem is actually getting that money to work in the right places. So uh, I had this background knowledge knowing that we, we had this huge funding gap for climate change mitigation uh, and adaptation, but not enough money being put to work. Uh, and I suddenly realized, hang on a minute, if we could figure out a way of putting all of that money to work in the right place, then we could begin to solve it. Why, why isn't my pension fund investing into carbon removal? It can take money, plant trees, capture carbon, sell carbon, generate income, and I can do good with it as well. And that, that was really my jumping off point. I got completely obsessed with that concept and thought, well, I, I have to at least try. And worst case scenario, I might be able to come back and, and do this again. 
So that was about three years ago. I, I left the job. I went to do, actually went to do a, a master's course in climate change management and finance to, to kind of help me really upskill because I realized it was quite a niche market and there was a lot of things I didn't know. So I did a course that, that helped me academically, but actually just also gave me the space to deep dive into it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure as sort of fellow entrepreneurs and business owners, it takes a bit of time to really flesh everything out and figure out what, what is the company? How can we actually get this to work? I was very fortunate that I met Rob, my co-founder and business partner um, there as well. Unfortunately, it was also peak COVID time. So I started the course in person. We ended up fully remote, but there was a little bit of, um, of funding that we could apply for that, that allowed us to just get off the ground. And then we were very fortunate again to get some grant funding from the UK government, which helped us really build the core technology. And then from that point, we could start sort of spinning everything up. We did some paid pilots. We found some landowners. We started piecing everything together. But yeah, I mean, how did I get here? It was really frustration, anger, surprise, and uh, yeah, slight obsession, probably. <laughs> of all of those bits mixed together. <laughs> no, it sounds like it, it's, it's uh, from that, that eureka moment that you had that, you know, and then that's, you know, typical of an entrepreneur, isn't it, where you, you know that there's a problem, you need to find a solution, and you're so passionate and driven about resolving that issue that it ends up becoming a business and before you know it it's it's uh, growing arms and legs and uh, but it sounds as though you know in, in terms of what you're doing at the moment it's creating a really positive impact for our planet and, and doing a lot of good so yeah well done and uh, yeah long may that continue so um going going back to carbon offsetting uh so are your carbon offsetting programs actually verified Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. So a big piece of our work is working with landowners to make sure they're creating validated and verified carbon removal projects. So in the UK, that means that we work under the Woodland Carbon Code. Excitingly, we're going to start working under the Peatland Carbon Code for a few projects. And we're actually helping create a new standard as well for rewilding. Specifically, we're creating a protocol, not yet a standard. So we're trying to get better at wording. <laughs> so, so moving away from standards that aren't quite standards to essentially a consistent process for how to develop, project, and then uh, actually track the impact of, of that. Rewilding is, is such an exciting opportunity, again, from that kind of natural capital, you know, many different services delivered. Uh, rewilding has, has so much opportunity, but you actually just can't generate any carbon credits from rewilding at the moment because there's no consistent process for tracking it. It's It's complex. It's got bushes and scrub and things that just aren't sort of large trees essentially to, to track fortunately some of the tech that we're building helps to unlock that and, and we're very fortunate to be working with the nep estate down in sussex and, and arab and, and a few other project partners to, to do that as a consortium so yes we work with those entities in the uk and internationally the projects that we're scoping and developing will be listed under under vera as well um, so the, the international standard the important part for us is that we bring an additional layer of accounting to those projects as well. So we, we can help the development. We can make sure that those projects go through the standard and the verification. So there's always a third party auditor, but we have a healthy skepticism around the quality threshold that that alone kind of passes over. So our, our system is essentially the accounting layer that we can then pass on to the auditors. So at the moment, nobody actually does the accounts for these projects, nobody actually knows how much carbon is in a forest. That's the bit that we solve. We pass those numbers over to the auditor. They can then use that to inform their own kind of audit and, and process. And then that gets passed to the standard, which then issues the carbon credits. So we, we kind of place ourselves in the middle, but it's very high resolution, evidenceable data that we, we hand over to them. It's such an exciting space that you're in right now. And, you know, hearing about, um, you know, the protocol on rewilding is, yeah, such an exciting opportunity. So how would our podcast listeners get to find out about the latest information, what you're up to? How can they follow you? How, where can they go to, to to get more information about Tree Economy and the work that you're doing? So our website is www.treeconomy.co, not .com or .co.uk, just .co. So that's, that's the website you can find us as well. We're increasing our, our presence on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I think we have an Instagram page as well. So you can, you can find us on there. I would recommend giving us a, a follow. 
we don't yet have an emailing list. We are collecting some emails for a newsletter. So then we can start actually delivering updates and, and information. And yeah, on the website, you can actually find uh, a tab for Sherwood for our platform. You can have a look at some of the projects, kind of the, the show home projects as we refer to them. So you can see the, the data that we work with. Um, you can create an account on there as, as well, if that's of interest. But yeah, I'd say website, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, we're across, across all of those. That's fantastic. Well, yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Harry. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with you today. It's good to catch up with you as well, because I know we haven't spoken for a few months. So yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So we'll include the links to Tree Economy and how you can follow them on LinkedIn, Instagram, etc. They'll all be in the show notes. So uh, if you go onto the media player that you're listening to, the show notes will be linked there. And for any additional information if you can go over to www.blackmoresuk.com where this podcast will be on the website along with other podcasts on that I, I mentioned at the very beginning when we were talking about ISO 14064 and PAS 2060 if you're looking at, uh, at raising standards but obviously using credible offsetting organizations as, as part of that solution so thanks very much for listening and I look forward to catching up with you on the next ISO show. Looking to achieve certification to an ISO standard or just need a helping hand with ISO compliance? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com 